Hi guys, it's Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command. And I am here on my birthday. Yay! Three cheers. I'm having a wonderful birthday. Angelique and Elaine took me out to a great breakfast, and um, we have things planned for later in the day. Wonderful day. But I also wanted to do another installment of my History of Science Fiction film. And uh, so, but first, I want to show you two very cool things related to this subject that um, Elaine uh, got me for my birthday. And, uh, and so forth. So, well, first of all, here, I thought I wanted to share this with you. I just got this. This is a signed photo of the creature in the, from the Black Lagoon, which we talked about in the previous installment. Now, there are two actors who played the creature in that movie. Uh, one was walking on land, kind of just a standard slow monster, but the one underwater was phenomenal. Rico Browning, and this is signed by him, and he was an amazing swimmer, and there's an amazing scene with her, with him swimming under the female lead, and who's unaware of him as they swim, and it's a, a ballet, it's an amazing, amazing scene, and it was the inspiration for The Shape of Water by Guillermo del Toro, so um, it's, I'm really thrilled that I could get a signed photo of, of Rico Browning to adorn my wall. Now also, and this is the thing that Elaine just got me, now this is, we mentioned in the previous installment, The Thing from Another World, based on the no novella by John W. Campbell, who would become the uh, editor of Astounding uh, science fiction magazine, and then it was made into a great, great film by uh, John Carpenter that we'll get into when we get into the 80s. But here's the, here's the fun thing about this. It is signed. Look at that. It's signed by John W. Campbell, and that is super cool. And it has an amazing cover by Hannes Bach, or perhaps pronounced Hans Bach. And this, he was an artist who was a friend of Ray Bradbury's, and when Ray first went to New York to get book contracts for himself that resulted in the Martian Chronicles and um, the Illustrated Man. He also took a portfolio of art by Hannes Bach and got him magazine and book cover assignments. And you can see just an amazing, interesting artist. He was a, a, a protege of uh, Maxfield Parrish, the great illustrator and artist, and there's a strong influence. But but this uh, this is all his own work, his own style, and he sadly died at 49 far too young, but uh, but was one of a kind, really one of a kind. I'm thrilled to have this book in my collection now. Thank you, Elaine. And obviously, the Space Command is still going strong. We're shooting tomorrow a day on the green screen st stage uh, with the Battle of Titan, and it'll include of combat synthetics and rebels, uh, insurgent rebels uh, running from them, being massacred. And we have all sorts of ray pistols and ray rifles and cool space suits and cool uh, uniforms and you name it, it's going to be great. And uh, we're just shooting for one day uh, in and out. And so, uh, but we'll be shooting more in September and more in October and onward to January and so forth. Lots to come, lots of amazing announcements very, very shortly. And obviously, if you want to buy shares in Space Command, you can. Um, Look down there, and you can, <laughs> you know, buy them for seventy-five hundred dollars each. It's what's keeping things going. We are ramping up. We're building alien hibernation ships. We're building creatures. We're building all oh, sorts of cool stuff. So, um, so you can all be part of it, and the more the better. And uh, we're entering phase two of our spacesuit contest. I'll be announcing more about that soon. And uh, and I talked about Space Patrol recently. There are two original boxes featuring Commander Cor Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy, big inspirations for Space Command, and uh, these are the original boxes where they would advertise uh, the serial, and you could get wonderful Space Patrol prizes and all sorts of stuff. So, but now, let's go on to the history of science fiction film. Now, we left off in 1954. The 50s was such an amazing decade for science fiction film that uh, it takes two videos <laughs> <laughs> to talk about it, but um, but as we as we get into the second half of the fifties, more and more we're having certain people emerge as the defining. Uh, I was going to say auteurs. They're basically the great artists of science fiction film of this era, where their films were cut above, and and one of them was a young man named Ray Harryhausen, and that's him right there. And you can see it's signed to me because I actually worked with Harryhausen on on a number of projects, including the sequel to Jason and the Argonauts, which we'll talk about at some point, and. Um, but the, uh, he was a stop-motion animator, and he was basically the creative force behind the films he worked on increasingly. And so he did a number of films that we'll be talking about through the 50s and, uh, and into the 60s, 70s, and beyond. He was uh, just an incredible inspiration and an incredible filmmaker. And stop-motion was that you'd have these creatures uh, with metal armatures and foam rubber you know, over them, latex, etc., and have dinosaurs, creatures, you know, whatever, and you'd move them frame by frame, 24 frames a second, 
and if you screwed it up, you had to start all over again. So an amazing and, and very difficult process. And he learned from Willis O'Brien, the great animator from King Kong, the genius of King Kong. And so, so the other um, great, great uh, filmmaker of the 50s was um, George Pal, And again, he would be making films uh, like Destination Moon, and we'll get into more of his films as we go on. But again, he was doing it for the love of it. You could tell he would go to science fiction conventions and... Um, and again, he was he was just an amazing man and an amazing amazing visionary, but but at the same time, they were trying to make a number of movies into science fiction films that didn't get made. Science fiction classics such as this is one of them, The Demolished Man, by Alfred Bester, which is about a man in a telepathic society who, who commits murder, and this and the stars by Destination, another great novel by Alfred Bester, and for decades people have been trying to make these into films and not successful, but that's when in the 1950s they were starting that process. I mentioned that even from the 1930s Cecil B. DeMille was trying to make War of the Worlds before George Powell finally made a terrific version of it with Gene Barry, and um, but ongoingly a lot of science fiction novels would start to be developed into films and not get made. There's a great book called uh, about those unmade science fiction films that you can uh, find on Amazon and eBay and so forth and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get a copy of it and hold it up uh, soon in Mr. Sci-Fi. But meantime, let's, let's just br you know, jump in and talk. So we'd mentioned George Powell. This is another film he did uh, in 1955, The Conquest of Space. It was directed by Bry Byron Haskin who directed um, War of the Worlds and would later direct uh, Robinson Crusoe on Mars. And uh, it stars an, um, um, you know, Mickey Shaughnessy, Eric Fleming, Walter Brook, etc. It's not as good as some of the other films, but still very fun. And it has Ross Martin in it. Ross Martin was a great, wonderful actor who was in The Twilight Zone, who would distinguish himself as Artem Artemis Gordon in uh, uh, Wild Wild West in the 60s. And uh, I interviewed him when I did The Twilight Zone Companion. He was a great, great man. And, uh, and you can actually listen to my interview with him uh, on, um, on um, Mr. Sci-Fi and also on you know, other places, uh, the new Twilight Zone Companion, etc. But this is a fun movie. It's got you know, a space station and all of these cool things. A little bit tedious in some ways, but still a really good try, really good effort. Now also, uh, that year Ray Harryhausen did a movie called It Came From Beneath the Sea with this tentacled creature that comes up out of the water. And it was an octopus, but, um, uh, but they, he didn't want to animate eight tentacles, so they settled on five and figured that that would be plenty. And, but it's a fun movie. It stars Ke Kenneth Toby from um, uh, The Thing from Another World and also Faith Domergay, who's in all, all sorts of science fiction films, including This Island Earth, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, just a fun black and white film. Now, most of these films were in black and white. Every now and then, uh, a bigger budget film would be in color, and those colors would be technicolor and very lush and very striking, and we'll, we'll talk about that. because. That, and, and then also, in addition to science fiction novels and other sources, for these films, uh, most of which were, by the way, original, written from whole cloth by some screenwriter and or the producer, or both. Uh, but also there was a series of films uh, being made in England. And um, uh, in this, in now, now one of the things in the 1950s that was happening in America, more with mainstream films, was that live TV had debuted and after the war, and you started getting some very, very um, wonderful uh, live TV productions like Requ Requiem for Heavyweight and Marty and Twelve Angry Men, Judgment at Nuremberg, and they would be then made into, um, they were live TV, and they were then made into feature films that really stood out and distinguished themselves. In England, it was slightly different where uh, there were science fiction TV shows that were then made into films. And in this case, to get a wider market, an American market, they would cast some American movie star who was slightly on the fade, perhaps, and uh, and it would be the, an all British cast except for this one uh, American movie star who was who was you know the big budget item. And um, so there was a wonderful writer named Nigel Neal who wrote for television, and he came up with a character called Quatermass. Now often that's mispronounced Quatermass. It notes Quatermass, just like it's Alan Quatermain in King Solomon's Mines, not Quatermain. Uh, but um, and so, he, so there was the first movie was called the Quatermass Experiment, and it starred. And this is one of the Quatermass, Quatermass in the Pits. This is actually the BBC, the original TV version of this from the 50s, quite wonderful. But um, uh, the first Quatermass film was called the Quatermass Experiment, and it starred Brian Donlevy, who was a sort of a 
B-level movie star in America. He was in a number of films. I think he's in The Glass Key, tons of other stuff. And I think maybe he had a drinking problem, perhaps not. Maybe I'm being mistaken with pretty much every other actor of that era. But um, but he, he starred in this. And he's not great as Quatermass, because Quatermass is supposed to be this brilliant and slightly acerbic uh, scientist. And Don Levy is just not quite right for the role. But it's still a wonderful film about a, a spaceship that comes back from, from outer space. And uh, the, all, mo all of the astronauts are gone. Are gone. Uh, except for one who starts changing to something no, not human. So it's quite a fun film. And there's some, I think, video of the original TV version still extant, which you can find if you search for it. But it's, it's, it's a good, very, very good film. And it was directed by Val Guest, whom I met. I was on a panel with him some years ago. And he was a very erudite man, a really wonderful guy, and a, a very good director. And so, um, so he did a good job with this. And he would direct other Quatermass films as well. Uh, now, at the same time, uh, you started to get um, films like um, you started to get a lot of giant, giant animal films and giant creature films and giant person films, uh, and this was kind of spurred by the success, the success of them uh, previously, because we talked about that. That was you know giant ants, giant ants. Oh no, giant ants! And uh, but um, but you started getting things like um, tarantula. You know, and uh, and then you also got Revenge of the Creature, which was a sequel to The Creature uh, from the Black Lagoon, which has succeeded previously. So when something succeeded, you get a lot of knockoffs or sequels, etc. Just like kind of nowadays, but even more so. And but you also start to get some directors who were very very good, like Jack Arnold, who started directing a number of films that were really solid. And again, you might think of him as sort of the third notable person of this period because he was directing, he directed um, Revenge of the Creature and The Creature from the Black, Black Lagoon and Tarantula, and it came from outer space. And he was, he was very, he was a cut above. And, um, and uh, he really s seemed to care about what he was doing. Now then, then you get another great science fiction film. And it's, it was based on a novel by Raymond F. Jones, this is the first edition of the novel. It was called This Island Earth. And it was made into a wonderful, wonderful, full-color science fiction film. Here it is. And it starred, it starred Jeff Morrow as an alien. And it starred, um, I be believe it's Rex Reason. I always get his name mi mixed up. Yes, Rex Reason, who's kind of a, a deep-voiced hero kind of guy. And Faith Domergay. And, uh, and it's, a, it's just a wonderful, strange film about a scientist who gets this sort of a how-to uh, manual in the mail and he starts building this alien technology including the interocitor which is very memorable it's sort of a big screen triangular tv and uh and if you look closely there was mutants these are the monsters in the film and they're very ridiculous and wonderful and it's just a great film and jeff morrow is very 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 good as the uh, the alien and um and he's um you know, he's in a kind of this big domed makeup with this white hair as are all of his race. And he would later be in a number of things. He'd been a, he, was, he was a real so solid actor. He was in a Twilight Zone episode as well uh, of a couple of years later. And um, just, just really, really fun. Really fun. And I, I highly recommend that film. So now, so that's 1955, just one year so far. And now we get into, and so you can see that these science fiction movies were proliferating. And in addition to, we mentioned last time that the movie theaters had one screen which showed two movies, and uh, that was how it worked. Now there were also drive-in movies, and there's still a few of these extant, but not many, where you would take your whole family, kids would be in the back seat in their pajamas, and you would drive into this big open lot, and there'd be a microphone, a speaker, a speaker that you would put on the, the, your windshield, and it would have a volume control. It was this big metal heavy object, and there'd be a screen in front of you, and this is all outside, and uh, you'd watch from your car. And uh, it was really fun, and also teenagers would go on dates, and they could make out in their car, in the privacy of their cars, and um, and again, it would often be a double bill, and uh, it was it was terrific fun. If you have you ever, if you haven't ever been to a drive-in, I I would suggest you go just because it's uh it's a unique experience and one that I personally really love. And uh, so, but okay, so now we get into 1956. Now, one of the films that was made now previously on one of the Mr. Sci-Fi um, videos, we talked about the great dystopic novels of the mid. Uh, 20th century, and one of them was 1984, which came out in 1949. It was written by George Orwell. It's the great novel of totalitarianism. It's um, commenting on many, many things, and it's still being 
used uh, to refer to um, revised history and revised language and euphemisms and and changing the narrative so that someone who was your enemy is now your friend and now someone who was your friend is now your enemy. I'm talking about geopolitics and it's a great and very dark book and uh, and so it had been made on radio a few times by this point uh, Peter Cushing in England had played it on radio no he played it in the live TV version and also uh, Richard Widmark had played it on radio here in the States and this was the first film version in movie version and this starred Edmund O'Brien who again was a sort of a, uh, a well-known kind of B-movie actor and um, and he plays Winston Smith, the hero. Now, years later, John Hurt would play this role and, uh, and be very, very good in it. But this is the first version of it. And it's, very, it's solid. Uh, Michael Redgrave's in it. Donald Pleasance is in it. Jan Sterling plays the female lead. Um, it was, for many years, it was a very hard film to find. I think now it's much more um, accessible and, and you can locate it and watch it. And I, I recommend it. Um, then they made the, now, now here in 1956, they make the third Creature movie, The Creature Walks Among Us. And it has Rex Reason and Jeff Morrow fresh off this island earth. And um, it's okay. I mean, the three creature films are okay, but the first one is really the, the really remarkable one. And, uh, and that's the one I really recommend. But those are universal monster movies and uh, with a science fiction edge. Now, at the same, so now moving down, in 1956, we get, um, basically we get, uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, which is a great Ray, Ray Harryhausen film. Now, Harryhausen, at this stage in his career, is primarily doing science fiction films uh, from, you know, and uh, and this is animated, stop-motion animated Flying Saucers, and they're terrific. And uh, and a lot of great monuments get destroyed in this film, and and robots are attacking and all sorts of stuff. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a terrific film. Uh, Hugh Marlowe's in it, very solid leading man. And uh, but the and Morris Ankrum, who was in a lot of these films, and often playing a general. And um, but but the flying saucers and Harryhausen's work is is really the standout element in this film. And uh, and later when Tim Burton did Mars Attacks, he was satirizing the flying saucers in this movie. So you can if you watch the two movies back to back as a little uh, homemade double feature, you'll find yourself very well rewarded. It's 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 really fun to see. You know, and, and Guillermo del Toro and, and Tim Burton and many, many filmmakers of, of, of the later generations would, would idolize Harryhausen and get to know him personally. Now, but then we get to the great film of 1956. MGM, the greatest studio in the world, uh, decided to make a big budget science fiction movie. Now, they had done many of the great films uh, from Wizard of Oz to um, Gone with the Wind, on and on. I mean, they were, they were the gold standard. And so finally they decided to make Forbidden Planet. Now, Forbidden Planet is great in every way. Great in every way. It stars Earl Holloman as a cook. He's kind of the comedy relief. And Leslie Nielsen as the captain. This is back when he played hero roles before he became a comedian in things like Naked Gun. Uh, he was a very good leading man. Warren Stevens is in it. John Anderson. Wonderful cast. Walter Pigeon, who'd uh, been a movie star at MGM for many years, plays the sort of the, the, the villain. And the female lead is Anne Francis. Now, she was great in The Twilight Zone later on in the after hours. She later would play Honey West. I interviewed her when I did The Twilight Zone Command. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. Very um, beautiful. Even when I interviewed her, she was still very beautiful. Incredible blue eyes and blonde hair and um, just, just a, an amazing woman. And the visual design in Forbidden Planet is phenomenal. Now, this is the first edition paperback of Forbidden Planet, and it shows the spaceship, which is a flying saucer, and was later used, and basically Twilight Zone used all of this stuff, again, you, many episodes, and that's Robbie the Robot, and one of the, one of the greatest robot suits ever built, and just, um, just a, a great, great, great design. Marvin Miller, who was in the TV show The Millionaire, did the voice, and was very distinctive. This is, again, uh, the, the Blu-ray, which gets the color of the uniform wrong, and, <laughs> but I think I'm going to be using some of the some of the uniforms and I, uh, other items from Forbidden Planet and Space Command just as a little tip of the hat, and that's Anne Francis, of course, and Leslie Nielsen, and and Anne Francis actually let me let me show you this, she um she signed a photo to me of herself and Robbie the robot, and look at that, isn't that great? The costume design is terrific. There were many costumes that weren't used in the movie. I think this one was not used. There was a wedding scene that was deleted uh, at the end of the movie. But it's it's terrific in every way. There's there, It's just exemplary. And Robbie the Robot is wonderful. The ray guns are run, wonderful. The creature from the id. With the an, there was animation that was done by Disney and the monster from the id. 
which might also be a great title for a certain president I won't name, but uh, of, of just phenomenal. The science, it's a truly science fictional, the story, and, and, and the great, it was a huge influence, by the way, on Star Trek later, and you can see the influence. I often tell people that my favorite, my two favorite Star Trek movies are Forbidden Planet and Galaxy Quest, but, um, but Forbidden Planet, one thing that makes it very unusual is it does, it starts in space, it lands on an alien planet where all the action takes place. There's no, you never see Earth. And so this is just a, a, a spaceship on patrol. And all the, all the men in this uh, obviously have been in World War II, so it feels like a World War II patrol ship. There's a sense of authenticity in it that really works. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically a science fictional riff on Shakespeare's play The Tempest about a, 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 a magician and his daughter who are on an island and she's never seen men other than her father and then all of a sudden a ship full of men arrives. And, um, and it's about a lot of that stuff. And The Tempest uh, is a great play. It's one of my favorite Shakespeare plays and this is a great, great adaptation. There's also, interestingly enough, a radio version of this um, from Australia. And if, I think if you go online you can find it. And it's very interesting to listen to it with different actors playing these roles, uh, really puts a different spin on it. For many, many years, they've tried to do a sequel or a remake of Forbidden Planet, have never uh, succeeded in doing that. Joe Straczynski worked on one of those. And, and, uh, and you can sort of see why, because it's such a great movie, the one they made, that you say, yeah, how would you top this? How could you possibly top this? They tried to make remake Day of the Earth Stood Still with um, Keanu Reeves, and it was um, a disaster. <laughs> and not, not Keanu Reeves' fault, but uh, just the, whereas the original was um, unforgettable. So same with Forbidden Planet. So if you haven't seen Forbidden Planet, watch it. It's, the colors are gorgeous. The visual, visual design is gorgeous. The Krell, uh, this dead alien race, are very evocative. In fact, it's a strong influence on those of us who've done science fiction since. You can see uh, a, a resonance of that in Babylon 5. You can see it in Space Command. Uh, just a, an amazingly influential and, um, and thought-provoking film. And, you know, it, and I mentioned before that most of the science fiction novelists looked down on these science fiction movies of the 50s. They thought they were sort of lame-brained and simplistic and stupid. And that was often the case. And not that I don't love them, I do. But um, but compared to the novels at the time, when you realize that Ray Bradbury and and Harlan Ellison and uh, Richard Matheson and on and on, everybody, Arthur C. Clarke. I mean, this was a golden age of science fiction. You can see some of these books behind me, and uh, and they so science fiction was a, written science fiction was at a much greater level of sophistication at this point than most of the movies. And again, as I said, most of the movies were about um, anxiety and one, one way or another fear of what might happen because of the Cold War and, and the threat of nuclear annihilation and, and the loss of self and alienation. I mean, these were great themes and you'd also see them in Twilight Zone. But uh, Forbidden Planet is, is one of a kind and, uh, and uh, so you should definitely check that one out. There are a few movies that are just you mustn't miss them. I mean, again, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is another great one. And This Island Earth is just just staggeringly beautiful, too. So, um, so, so, but also there were other movies less um, high-end in 1956, but no, no less um, remarkable. Now, in 1954, the Japanese, and we started to get foreign films that were then dubbed and altered to be American films. And um, one of these was a film that was shot in 1954 in Japan, it, and it dealt very much with the with the uh, the out the um, the ripple effect, the the outcome of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the threat of radiation and, and all of that. And it was a monster movie where a monster gets made that has this radioactive breath and and can destroy things. And that was a movie called Gojira, and it's a very good film in the original Japanese and well worth watching. That's a guy in a monster suit, but it really works nevertheless, and uh, wonderfully, wonderfully made. And then uh, two years later, it came out in an American version that took out all the reference to nuclear, you know, to, the, to Hiroshima, Nagasaki, all of that stuff went away. All the social commentary went away. And again, as with the Quatermass film, they decided to put a, an American into it to kind of give it greater box office possibility here. So there was a, a, an actor named Raymond Burr, and he'd been in Rear Window. He played the killer in Rear Window very effectively. Later, he would become Perry Mason, uh, a heroic lawyer on television for many years, and then Ironside, a detective in a wheelchair. So he was a very, he became a very famous television actor, but right now, he was sort of a known, but not as famous as he would ultimately become. But he was put in as a, a character named Steve Martin, interestingly enough, before Steve Martin was a known com comedian. And, 
and it's still a very good movie and it and they dubbed all of the Japanese into English so they got actors who could do that and one of them was a young actor this was I think his first professional gig uh, a young actor named George Takei and uh, so if you listen I think you can hear hear his voice in this uh, so he did a lot of dubbing work but then so so that's another film that's really worth seeing and then there's and then finally we get to um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Now this again was based on a book by Jack Finney who was pals with Matheson and Beaumont and a lot of these guys knew each other and um, and it, this is a wonderful novel. It has an, a surprisingly upbeat happy ending which really doesn't work in the novel. It's a great book cover by the way. Look at that. Just amazing. The Body Snatchers. And uh, but it was made into this movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers starring Kevin McCarthy and Dana Winter and uh, and King Vita and um, King Donovan's in it as well, and the basic idea. It's been remade several times, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's one of the great films of loss of self, of being taken over by the other. And it was directed by Don Siegel, who would become uh, a very well-known director of action films, uh, some of Clint, e Clint Eastwood's movies, etc. And he just 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 knocks it out of the park here. It's phenomenal. Um, it's about aliens coming and taking people over and replacing them and it's been likened to a, a, an analogy about the blacklist and loss of self and it's also been likened to communist takeover. I mean basically whether you're on the left or the right you can write your own meaning into what this movie means but but just taken as a film as a as a wonderful. Car Carolyn Jones also is in it and she would later be Marticia Adams on The Adams Family, a, a, a t great TV series of the 60s but um, but this film is, is perfect in every way. It has a very unsettling ending, which then dovetails into the into the sequel that was made uh, by Philip Kaufman years later, decades later, starring Donald Sutherland and um, Leonard Nimoy and so forth, and uh, another great film, a creepy film. It, this, the, the, the second Invasion of Body Snatchers is also a wonderful movie. I, I can highly recommend it. We'll talk about that more when we get to that decade. But, uh, but for now, Invasion of the Body Snatchers in the 1950s, if you haven't seen it, um, you should. And then, uh, and then finally, we get to a, a, a film called It Conquered the World, which stars Peter Graves, who I mentioned before was, uh, he was on Mission Impossible, he was in the movie Airplane as the pilot, he's the brother of James Arness, who would be on Gunsmoke and was also in The Thing and also in Them. So there's, there's just a lot of cross-fertilization, everybody knowing everyone. It also stars Beverly Garland and Lee Van Cleef. Beverly Garland was in a Twilight Zone episode, uh, The Four of Us Are Dying, very memorable as a torch singer in that. She was in a lot of, of sort of um, B-movies. And, um, and Lee Van Cleef was sort of a little-known actor. He was kind of in supporting roles. He was on Space Patrol as kind of villains. Uh, but, he, but then he would go to Italy uh, just as um, you know, other actors did. He would he he, he starred in Sergio Leone's um, Italian westerns, the spaghetti westerns, and became famous. And then came back to America and was famous, just just like Clint Eastwood. So um, very fun. But what's most notable, I think, about it, it conquered the world, is it was a it was produced by a young um, movie producer named Roger Corman. And Roger Corman would go on to be known as the great producer of cheap cheap science fiction films and uh, and many other exploitation films as well and there he, his work wouldn't be usually great but there was something again endearing about it and uh, he would later make The Intruder with William Shatner based on the novel by Charles Beaumont one of the few films that didn't succeed financially for him he made hundreds of films and uh, and so again if you're not aware of Roger Corman he's well worth checking out um, uh, Little Shop of Horrors was one of his films, the non-musical version that was made in the 60s, and then it became a big hit as a musical. But um, but just a very inventive guy and uh, and with a very interesting story. I met him once and uh, thanked him for his body of work, and uh, he was a, a very charming man. So, um, so that's 1956. Again, many, many, many. I haven't even, I mean, I'm not even mentioning all the films that came out in these years, science fiction films, but there were plenty of them. But uh, and Rodan came out that year too, and that might be the film where George Takei got his start. It was one of the one of these early Japanese monster films, and then X the Unknown, another another you know interesting film with Leo McKern and Dean Jagger. Just well you know just a well made film. Um, so now we get to 1957, and 1957 has one of the great Harryhausen films, Twenty Million Miles to Earth. And again, that's probably playing off the title 20 million, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 
but it is a great film. It stars, um, basically stars this creature, the Emir, and with a Y, Y-M-I-R. This is the novel that was written from the movie. It's very rare, and it was written by Henry Sleesar, adapted by Henry Sleesar, who was mainly a mystery writer, and he would be very well known as a writer on the Alfred Hitchcock show, and, uh, and he published a lot of stories in the pulps. Not, not that well known now, but this is a rarity, and it's a great cover. And the film was in black and white, but the emir is generally, uh, decide, you know, uh, well, well, here's the funny part of that film. Here is the, and it was done, animated by Ray Harryhausen and sculpted and designed by Ray Harryhausen. It's a very fun film. This is it. And um, this is the, D, the DVD, the Blu-ray, and uh, Harryhausen colorized the film for this edition. So you can watch this in black and white or color. And, uh, and either way, it's, it's a fun film. It's, um, you know, and it really shows Harryhausen's style. His, his, I mean, just he's, uh, he's one of a kind. There's no one doing films like him. And, and these films, are, although they're within the genre of, of 1950s science fiction films, have, have some, a different kind of quality. And, uh, it's, and this, this film stars William Hopper, who was Hedda Hopper's, the gossip columnist Hedda Hopper's son, and he would later be the second male lead on Perry Mason with Raymond Burr. So, um, but it's, it's, it's a very fun film, as are so many of these films. And additionally, that year, there was a movie called The Amazing Colossal Man, because as I said, you had, you had monsters growing big, you had people growing big, and The Amazing Colossal Man was, um, uh, Produced by Bert, R, per, directed and produced by Bert I. Gordon, and he was another like Roger Corman, like some of these guys. He would put out a lot of low-budget films through the 50s and 60s, and um, and again, one of these guys who was just uh, prolific, and uh, sort of, and and he's written his uh, his autobiography, which you can search out and, and read, and he talks about how he did what he did, and uh, but again, you know, there was a sense of. Movies were very costly. You had to do them on 35 millimeter film. You had to get distribution in movie theaters and drive-ins and so forth. And uh, it was a very different world from how it is now. There was no YouTube, no nothing like that. And uh, you had to be very scrappy, very resourceful if you were not connected to a studio, if you're working independently. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's 1957. And, um, and, and now we're in 1957. And we get to The Giant Claw, which stars Jeff Morrow from This Island Earth. But it's... Uh, it's not the best film ever made. It's, uh, <sighs> here's the problem with that film. Jeff Morrow, and Morris Ancrum's in it too, it's about a giant bird that goes on the rampage. And, and in this case, the bird was filmed in post-production. So they didn't know what the bird would look like. And, and Jeff Morrow had arranged to have the premiere of the movie in his hometown. And, and unfortunately, the monster is a giant goonie bird. It has these big bulging eyes and it goes, Grah! And it's, and it's rough of feathers. I think they were trying for some kind of vulture or something, but it looks absolutely ridiculous. And when Jeff Morrow was there in his hometown theater with everyone he knew in the town, and this thing came on the screen, he just sunk be below his chair. I think he snuck out of the theater. He was, he was mortified. And uh, it's, again, it's a fun film, but just ludicrous because of the, because of the monster. And again, this speaks to the fact that, that the monster, in a monster movie, the monsters are important. And either they work or they don't, or they maybe half work. And you had everything along that spectrum. And some of the creatures, like the, the Martian in War of the Worlds, is paper mache thrown together at the last minute, was falling apart as they were working it, and it looks great. It really works. And others like this don't. And we also got a movie written based on a novel by a young writer, Richard Matheson. He had become one of the great writers of the Twilight Zone. He had many, many movies based on his works, including I Am Legend and Duel. He wrote Duel, which was a great movie directed by Spielberg, a TV movie. And this copy, this is a first edition, and it is, if you look closely, and it's very fragile, I'll show you this. It is signed by Richard Matheson to me because I met him when I did The Twilight Zone Companion. He wrote such incredible episodes of The Twilight Zone. Uh, just an, uh, and, and when they made this movie, it's about a guy who shrinks. And it's a very, very good film. Uh, and I highly recommend it. It stars Grant Williams, another one of these leading men types. And the effects are very, very good. And it's just well-written. Matheson did the script. And it was directed again by Jack Arnold, one of the great directors of this era, of this genre. And. Um, and it's very thoughtful, and it's very interesting, and it really works. And again, he, he, his boat goes through a cloud of, of radioactivity from a bomb test, and he starts to shrink. And, uh, but it's really the props and costumes and everything really work. It really sells it. And, uh, and Matheson began a career in film and TV and books. And, um, 
he was one of a kind, just a, just a brilliant man with ideas like that no one had ever explored before. And he really, um, he was at the right man at the right time and, uh, and just did a, a phenomenal body of work. If you've never read his books, um, you should. And I Am Legend is a great, great example of his work. And, uh, and The Incredible Shrinking Man, well, they put incredible on the title because, you know, every, the movies were called astounding, incredible, amazing, you know, just hyperbole. And, uh, but that movie was successful as well and really got his career going. And um, then there was another movie called The Invisible Boy. Now, now, once a prop was made, a good science fiction prop, what the hell did you do with it? So as we mentioned, in Forbidden Planet, we had Robbie the Robot. And The Invisible Boy is a low-budget movie about a boy who befriend, befriends a robot. And that was the um, Robbie the Robot. Which, and Robbie the Robot started turning up in TV shows. He's, in, he's twice in Twilight Zone. He's in many, many, many TV shows and movies. And, and now, of course, there are a lot of people making replica Robbie the Robots so you can buy them if you're insane and have a lot of money. But uh, it's a great, great, great design. And, uh, and the, the designer of Robbie the Robot would go on to create the robot in Lost in Space, another great design. But... Um, the Invisible Boy. Often, I think. I think if you buy the box set of Forbidden Planet, it comes with that. The Invisible Boy. It's not a great movie, but like the Colossus of New York, it's about a boy befriending a robot. And you know that's uh, and and Iron Giant. Later, years later, the Iron Giant has that same gag. So you know. So it's basically you know, uh, a little boy and a big monstrous robot works as a. And then then another great giant robot movie is, but this is a really big robot, is Kronos, and uh, it's directed by Kurt Newman, a, a, a German expatriate, and is very, very fun. Again, it stars Jeff Morrow, who is in a lot of these movies, and um, it's in color, again, surprisingly, and the robot is very unusual looking and uh, really works. I think it was shot in 3D, if memory survive, um, um, if, mem if, if I'm right, <laughs> if memory recalls the, the, the facts, and, um, but it's a good film, the color palette's great, and, um, and fun, very fun. And, and, and it's funny because as, as you move through the 50s, you know, you've done giant uh, ants and giant tarantula and giant bird and praying mantis and, uh, you know, and you start to think, and, and robots on the rampage, and you start to think about well, what haven't we done? What can we still do? And we get the monolith monsters, which is probably one of the strangest ones. Now, it stars Grant Williams, who, again, we saw in Incredible Shrinking Man in the same year. And... Um, and it also has Les Tremaine, who was a very well-known radio actor, and he's in War of the Worlds, and he's in this, and very solid as a character actor. But um, the Monolith Monsters is so peculiar because basically it's about giant crystals from outer space that grow into these, these monoliths and then fall over, shatter, and then the shattered pieces grow. And as that, that way it proliferates and moves over the landscape. But there's no mind behind it. There's no, there's no there there. It's just growing giant crystals that we managed to defeat. And uh, so, but it's fun. It's a fun movie, but on, on the ridiculous side. But again, I can recommend it, and, um, and I do. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and you, you get a lot more monster movies. Monster, monster from Green Hell, you know, uh, Monster that Challenged the World, etc. Most of these are kind of like, well, you take, your, you take your chances. But then, um, then we get the second Quatermass movie, Quatermass 2. And again, it stars Brian Donlevy, which is, you know, not ideal, but it's written by Nigel Neal. It's based on the second Quatermass series from television, British television. Now, the Quatermass show, as far as I know, the TV version, did not air on American television. So you can track it down now on, uh, on DVD and Blu-ray. But um, and, and, and actually, the TV versions are better because they have actors, British actors, playing Quatermass who are better. Uh, than Brian Donlevy, who was just added for American potent box office potential. But, but Quatermass 2 was also directed by Val Guest, who directed the first Quatermass film. And it's a, it's a very fun film. Uh, and, um, and again, sometimes they'd have other titles that we slapped on for the American market. Um, but it's, um, it's a good one. It's a good one. So, so now we move into 1958. And, and, you know, and, and one thing to note is some of the actors... Um, would, would sort of be leading men in these movies of the 50s and would be distinctive because they were in so many of them and they, there was cross-fertilization and so forth so they, they might team up in one movie and be in different roles in others and so forth. But some movies would have actors, little-known actors at the time, who would become movie stars. And this was true of 1958's The Blob. And this is a movie that is better than it should be. Now, um, Steve McQueen became a huge movie star in the 60s. In the 1950s and the late 50s, he starred in a TV series called Wanted, Dead, or Alive. By the 60s, he'd done The Great Escape, and into the 70s, he was a huge movie star. And uh, played Bullet, all sorts of stuff. 
And this was, but here in, in this movie, he's just starting out and he's playing a teenager. And the, this movie's in color as well, and it, and it really works. But it's about a blob, a thing from outer space that's basically a gelatinous blob that grows and, and you have to run from it. And, um, and, and it, it's a good film, it's a fun film, but the thing that's really distinctive about this film is that Steve McQueen is a cut above. Everyone else is doing their 1950s style monster movie acting, and he's so natural and so interesting and so different um, that he really stands out. He's, he, you, can, you can see why he would become a movie star because he's, there's just this quality of realness and this quality of this angle of attack that's different from what everyone else is doing. And um, he, in, in the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you have him as a character in the movie, and, uh, but he was just a huge movie star. By the, by the 60s, he was... Um, up there with every, I mean, he was one of the top movie stars, and sadly died died very young, but um, but was a, an, an amazing presence. And, and again, if you haven't ever checked out his films, they're well worth worth checking out. And uh, and the Blob is fun. And it was, there were a few sequels made of it um, later on in the '60s and so forth. Not not that memorable, but this film is is again worth seeing. Criterion, interestingly enough, has a, a disc that has a lot of extras uh, about this movie. And again, that's the, really the way to see it. Now we mentioned earlier. Colossus of New York, which is a giant robot and a little boy who uh, befriends him, and uh, and this was uh, this came out in 1958. Stars stars Rosh Martin again from the uh, Wild Wild West and Twilight Zone. By the way, a great Twilight Zone episode that Ross Martin is in is one of the hour ones. It's called Death Ship, and it was written by Richard Matheson, and it has Jack Klugman, and it's a huge, huge standout. It's a terrific episode, so if you've never seen that one, that's another one I urge you to see. And it, the funny part is it actually uses uh, the uniforms from uh, the, the short-sleeved uniform from Forbidden Planet because uh, Twilight Zone was shot at MGM and utilized everything from Forbidden Planet. Now, um, now then, now I talked also about films that were um, being imported from other countries and dubbed into English. And there was a stop-motion animator who was very different in his style from Ray Harryhausen named Carl Zeman. And he was a Czechoslovakian director, and he was making some very interesting films. And one of these was The Fabulous World of Jules Verne, and it was brought over to America. And it has, um, it uses almost this, an illustration style from, from the 19th century. And it's kind of a steampunk kind of story. And it's very odd but really good and different and unique. And Carl Zeman would make a number of films in, and some of them got to America. There's another one uh, that when I was a kid, it was shown in installments. And I, I, for years, I wondered if I was the only person who had ever seen it. It was called Journey to the Beginning of Time. It's about some boys who take a, um, a, a, a boat trip uh, down this river and go back into time, back to the time of the woolly mammoth and then further to the time of the dinosaurs. And wonderful animation, wonderful film. D again, it had a framing story in English and then it was dubbed into English. And I have both the English version and the uh, the um, Czech version, which is probably superior, but they're both both really, really fun. But And that was in color, but Fabulous World of Jules Verne is in black and white. But again, Carl Zeman's work is well worth checking out. Um, and then there's another film we're talking about stop motion animation. This is a weird film, and it, oddly enough, Criterion has a disc on this too, Fiend Without a Face, which is, for first of all, one of the great titles, <laughs> Fiend Without a Face. And there's these invisible monsters that are attacking people and killing them and so forth. And this one I sort of have to give you a spoiler alert because when they reveal the creatures, when they're able to make them not invisible, to make them visible, they're stop-motion animated brains. They're brains with a spinal cord, and they move along, and they get shot, and the blood bubbles up, and it's unlike anything you've ever seen. It's it's the movie's worth watching just for that, just for the last few minutes, and uh, it was it's just a totally fun film, and it has Marshall Thompson in it, and um, you know, and Criterion must love it too because they did a, the you know, for the bell all the bells and whistles on that one, and um, and then and then. Uh, beyond that, uh, 1958 had a film called The Fly. And this is, it's based on a short story that appeared in Playboy uh, with the same title, The Fly. And it's about a guy trying matter transmission whose um, DNA gets mixed up with um, a fly. And so it's a really creepy movie. And there were two versions done of it. Um, uh, and, well, the first was The Fly and then The Return of the Fly, which was a direct sequel to this one. And then later they made a, Jeff Goldblum starred in a remake that, was by, that Cronenberg, David Cronenberg directed, which we can get to when we get to that decade again. But both films are great. And this one stars an actor named Al Hedison, who then would become David Hedison and star in Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the TV series. And, 
and it also has Vincent Price and Herbert Marshall. Now we talked about movies that use sort of older movie stars who had been big in the maybe 30s and 40s, and now by the 50s they're a little on the decline. Well, so this stars Vincent Price, very good in this film, and Herbert Marshall, who was one of the great leading men, and uh, and he's wonderful in this film as well. And um, Kurt Newman, again, the director we talked about a few minutes ago, directed this film and does a, does a very good job. This film is in color as well, and it has one of the great, great ending moments. And I won't spoil that one other than, than to quote it, which is, Help me! Which um, everyone who's ever seen that film quotes that line. And uh, But this is a creepy and strange and very interesting film, and I like it very much. And uh, they also did From the Earth to the Moon this year, and this was a big studio movie with movie stars, and uh, not a genre film as such. It's based on the novel by... Um, Jules Verne, and it stars Joseph Cotton and George Sanders and Deborah Paget. Deborah Paget was a young, sort of teen star, and um, Joseph Cotton, of course, had been in, you know, uh, many, many, many great films, Hitchcock films, and he was in Citizen Kane, and uh, and George Sanders again had been in Hitchcock films and many other films, and so they're very recognizable. It's directed by Byron Haskin, who did War of the Worlds, but it's not, it's not a great film, but it's okay. And then Tom Tryon starred in I Married a Monster from Outer Space. Now, again, some of these titles where you get that title and people are just going to go to it because of that title. They're like tabloid headlines. I Married a Monster from Outer Space is, is a good film. It's directed by Gene Fowler, who was a friend of, um, you know, of, of, of Hemingway. And, um, and, it's, uh, and Tom Tryon, who stars in it, would later give up acting and become a novelist. And he wrote a very uh, bestseller called The Others, which was made into a very creepy horror film, so about twins and little boy twins. And, uh, but, he, and, but he was a very competent actor, very good actor. And then we get to It, the Terror from Beyond Space. Now I'll tell you what the plot is, and you tell me if you've heard of this plot before. Uh, a monster gets aboard a spaceship and starts killing the crew. Now, if you said alien, you'd be correct. <laughs> because alien, there was, I, I believe there was even a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit because this film was obviously part of the inspiration behind um, Alien. And, uh, and, a no and a novel by A.E. Van Vogt was also an inspiration, um, you know, which we, we can talk about as, as well, because these, they, both of them, I think, filed suit, or at least threatened suit, and got paid off by, by, by the makers of Alien, uh, because uh, the, there were too many similarities, monster on, on an alien ship, killing people, and so forth. But, um, but if they hit Terror Beyond Space is kind of a low-budget thing, again, stars, stars Marshall Thompson, and the, the monster's kind of cool in a, in, a, in a monster suit kind of way, but um, it's not a great film, but it's a, it's a fun film. And if you're a fan of Alien, it's worth seeing just for the DNA of it. Uh, but, but then, you know, we, we continue finishing out 1958, and we have a few more distinctive films. We get, um, we get uh, Queen of Outer Space. Now, that again used costumes from Forbidden Planet. It stars Zsa Zsa Gabor, who was a well-known, there were the three Gabor sisters who were very, very beautiful, and their mother, who was beautiful, and they were from Eastern Europe, and uh, now Ava Gabor, her sister, starred in Green Acres, which is one of my favorite TV shows, uh, with Eddie Albert, and it's a wonderful, wonderful um, film. Now, Eddie Albert, by the way, on 1950s TV, he played, uh, he starred in 1984 as well, and that's a very good version, too. You can find it on YouTube, uh, and Eddie Albert was both a dramatic actor and a comedy actor, and uh, very good in both, and he makes a very good Winston Smith, and, um, and but but the Queen of Our Space is they dug up the studio dug up a a, um, a treatment an outline that had been written by Ben Hecht one of the great screenwriters uh, of of all time and they made it in the Queen of Our Space and they hired Charles Beaumont uh, who would later become the great writer of the Twilight Zone just a year later uh, to to write it and uh, and he said later that it, he wrote it as a comedy only the none of the actors or the director uh, seem to realize that and it's about astronauts who go to a, an alien planet and find beautiful women and it's it's really ludicrous it is absolutely ludicrous and it's in color and uh, but again if you want to have a fun time it's, it's kind of cheesy and kitschy and ridiculous but interesting and uh, so there's there's that now now but there were there were more serious films like the Space Children also came out the, that year it's a uh, Jack Arnold it's a good film it has Adam Williams who would be in the Hitchhiker uh, on Twilight Zone um, and 
and, it, and Johnny Crawford, who would be on The Rifleman as, uh, as, uh, as the son on that show. And, um, but it's, it's, it's a good film, and it's very serious and very heartfelt from Jack Arnold, the great, the great um, director of so many films of this era. And then finally, we were talking about Nigel Neal, the Quatermass shows, and his writing for television in England. Well, he wrote a piece called The Trollenberg Terror. And uh, it was a very good TV show about um, aliens attacking this mountain retreat uh, in, in the Alps. And uh, I think it's the Alps. And, um, and it was made into a movie. And, and like, like the Quatermass films, they found an American movie star, quote unquote, to, uh, to head this up. And it, uh, they, they chose Forrest Tucker. And this is actually, he's much better than Brian Donlevy. And this is a film I like very, very much. It's, it's shot, it, everyone else in it is English, including Janet Monroe, who plays the female lead, and she's very um, fetching. And it also has the actor who starred in Journey Into Space. So if you ever listen to Journey on, Into Space and want to find out what that lead actor looks like, the one who played Jet Morgan, he's in this. And it's wonderful, and it's well directed by Quentin Lawrence. And it was called The Trollenberg Terror. In The film was called The Trollenberg terror in England but of course America they want a, a more lurid title so here it is the crawling eye and it's uh, there's Forrest Tucker and Janet Monroe and it's a really 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 good film until the ending where you see the monster and then it becomes absolutely ridiculous and um, but still in, well worth seeing a very fun film I, I've seen it a number of times and I always enjoy it and uh, and so it's, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. And now, and now, now one, one final thing to mention, and then we get War of the Col Colossal Beast, which is another Bert, Bert I. Gordon movie, and War of the Satellites from Roger Corman, and Teenage Caveman from, from Corman. But, but we also get a film in 1958 now, through the entire decade, Ray Harryhausen had been directing a lot of science fiction movies, and finally he did the kind of film that would define a Ray Harryhausen film. Now, when I, I, I worked with both Ray, Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen. They had been friends since they were 16 and knew each other very well. And one thing that Ray Harryhausen said to me was, he said, uh, Ray Bradbury was always fascinated by the future. I was always more interested in the past, particularly the age of legends, uh, Greece and Rome and all of that, and, and the, the Thousand and One Nights. And in the Thousand and One Nights, which is from the Arab world, there was a, a hero named Sinbad. And Harryhausen in 1958 released this film, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And it's a great, great film. Here's another image from it. And you can see the monsters, some of the monsters he has, including the Cyclops. And it, it stars Kerwin Matthews. And it was, um, and again, the screenwriters and the directors are, hard, are really not the ones you pay attention to with a Harryhausen film because Harryhausen is choosing the story, choosing the set pieces, choosing the monsters. And he met a producer named Charles H. Schneer, and that would become the producer for the rest of his career. And they were really in sync. They were really simpatico. And they made these films that were relatively low budget, but just wonderful. And this is the first of those Harryhausen films. He would go on to make more Sinbad films, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, etc., and make Jason and the Argonauts, and on and on. And the films would have dinosaurs, they would have mythical creatures, and they were just wonderful. Just wonderful. Singular. Uh, no one was like Harryhausen. And, um, and, and, uh, and they really hold up. Though Harryhausen said one very funny thing. If you ever watch The, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, uh, it keeps cutting back to Sinbad's ship. Well, they didn't have the money to build a ship, and so they used stock footage. And if you look, and Harry Harryhausen pointed this out, I'd, I'd seen the film many times, never noticed it. Every time it cuts back to Sinbad's ship, it's stock footage of a different ship. <laughs> and they just figured, no one's going to notice. It's a ship, and you cut to Sinbad, and you're good. So, <laughs> so that's, that's how it worked. And again, this is, this is the, the, the DVD, and run out, see every, every Harryhausen film you can. They're all, all worth it. So now we get to the last year of the 50s, 1959, and it had been this great period uh, of, of science fiction films. The 60s, you would see a decline in the quality and the, and the number of science fiction films. You would start getting great TV shows. Uh, Twilight Zone debuted in 1959, uh, then you get the, and through the 60s, you get The Outer Limits and Star Trek, and, uh, but, but there are fewer and fewer really good science fiction films. They kind of exhausted themselves, and the giant bug craze, you know, giant ants, giant insects of all kinds, uh, kind of died, died out. It, it, it had run its course. And, um, but as we got, and, and also it was a very different world because the 1950s were predominantly um, 
uh, Eisenhower as the president. It was kind of people not wanting to rock the boat. There was the blacklist, there was the Cold War, but mainly people were becoming middle class, building their lives, having their kids, wanting stability, wanting normality, a normalcy. And uh, but so these movies were sort of their again their uh, their expressions of their fear. So you get the 4D Man, which stars Robert Lansing and Lee Merriweather. Now Robert Lansing would star in the TV show 12 O'clock High. He was in a great Twilight. It's an episode called The Long Morrow. I interviewed him. Very very nice guy and. Um, and uh, he's, he's good in this. It's a color film. Lee Merriweather would later play um, uh, Catwoman on Batman, uh, as would Eartha Kitt. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a fine film. There's also The Angry Red Planet, which is about a mission to Mars. A lot of these films are about missions to Mars. And this is a really weird one. It has, again, Les Tremaine, whom we talked about before. And it's, and, and it's, it's directed and written by Ib Melchior, who was a Scandinavian. And he was, again, I was on the panel with him, with Val Guest. And Ib Melchior lived to be a, uh, lived to an advanced age. And he had these weird, strange ideas, and they're very interesting because they're distinctive, but they're very strange. And so this movie, it's got this weird red color when they're on Mars, and it's strange, and it's got this creature that's sort of a bat, rat, spider thing. Again, very distinctive looking. You can buy toys of that creature now, model kits of that creature. It's, it's worth seeing, again, for just the weirdness of it. Now, then there's another movie called the, uh, from 1959 called The Atomic Submarine. Now, some of us, and I'm sure you ha you've had this experience too, there's a movie you see when you're a kid, and you think it's an absolutely great movie, and then you see it as an adult, and you realize it's, it's, it's crap, and yet you hold both versions in your mind, the expensive, cool version and the crap version that you saw as an adult, and somehow you still have affection for it, even though you realize how ridiculous it is. And I'm that way with The Atomic Submarine. It stars Arthur France, who was also in Invaders from Mars and other films, and a very solid leading man. Dick Ferran is in it, too. He was sort of a kid actor in earlier decades. And, uh, and it's just it's about an atomic submarine and an alien monster that gets aboard the submarine. And the monster's kind of ridiculous. It's sort of an eyeball being held by a hand in a sock, more or less. But, but I just it's a, it's a film I love. I can't help it. I saw it when I was a kid, and it, it just really spoke to me. I, I love science fiction a film set underwater on submarines or, or other things. I, 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 the Abyss is one of my favorite films, and uh, so, so I can't get enough of it. There's another underwater film coming soon with Kristen Stewart. I hope it's good. We'll see. We'll see. It looks like kind of just a knockoff of Alien, but uh, you never know. You always hope for the best. And then we start getting more foreign films, There's from, particularly from the Eastern Bloc. There's, so there's Battle Beyond the Sun, uh, which is an Eastern Bloc film. There's Battle in Outer Space, which is another Japanese film. Um, you know, and again, entertaining, very different aesthetic. And so if you watch those films, you see a different kind of headspace at work. But, but the Soviets were doing a lot of, the Soviets and the East Germans started doing a lot of science fiction films. And, and a writer by the name of Stanislaw Lem, who would write Solaris, which was made into a great Russian science fiction film later in the 70s, he started writing novels. And he became a hugely popular writer in the Eastern Bloc. He was a Polish writer, and he was published widely in science in, um, in, in the Soviet Union, etc. And we'll talk more about him when we get into later decades. But his films, his novels, Novels started being made into science fiction films, and uh, and so then and so then we're, so as we're rounding out 1950s, 1959, we get the Invisible Invaders, which is a creepy film. It stars John Agar, who we haven't talked about, but he's another one of those leading men of the 50s. He's in a lot of films, and John, and John Carradine is in this film too. By then, he was again an aging movie star. He'd been in Grapes of Wrath. He'd been in many great films. He'd be terrific in The Twilight Zone and things like The Howling Man. Uh, but he was, he started by, by this period, he was in a lot of low budget horror and science fiction films. And, and okay, okay. And, uh, but Invisible Invaders is about invaders who, in, who take over the bodies of dead people and bring them back to life. I saw it as a kid, it scared the hell out of me. And it's very reminiscent, it has a lot of similarities in terms of just the way it's staged to Night of the Living Dead, which would be made, um, in the 60s. And, uh, but it's, wor it's worth checking out. The black and white really serves it because it's kind of stark and creepy. And, uh, and then there was another, then there was Journey to the Center of the Earth and just like another big budget studio film based on Jules Verne's novel. Uh, it stars Pat Boone, who was a singer, sort of a squeaky clean singer of the time, with James Mason, who had been in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Arlene Dahl and Diane Baker, who was sort of two leading ladies of the time. Um, Diane Baker would later star in the Night Gallery, gallery episode, um, they're tearing down Tim Riley's bar. She was a wonderful actress. She was a member of my round table, and she's still with us, thank God. But she's uh, very, very distinctive. She always comes across with intelligence. But again, this is 
the genre films were made by people who loved the genre, who had an, who had an affinity for the genres. Big studio pictures, more often than not, if, even if they had a, a fantasy or a science fictional element, uh, if they were made by people who didn't have the feel for it, then they'd just be okay, you know, and this is sort of one of those okay films. Um, and then they made the sequel this year to The Fly, Return of the Fly, which still has Vincent Price in it, which is fun. And, uh, and also we have The World, the Flesh, and the Devil, which is another after, after the bomb story. We talked about there are many, many after the bomb stories. And in this one, it's a triumvirate of Inger Stevens, who would also be on two great Twilight Zone episodes, most notably The Hitchhiker. And, um, and she's phenomenal. She later started in the Farmer's Daughter TV show with William Wyndham. And uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful actress and very beautiful. And it stars Inger Stevens, Mel Ferrer, who is a movie star. This is another big budget um, movie in black and white, but a studio film. And Harry Belafonte, who was a great singer, very good actor, very, very, very handsome. But because of the racial limitations of the time, what normally should have been a romantic triangle, he's not allowed to have a romance with Inger Stevens because she's, you know, they were looking, they, wa they always wanted at this stage, they generally wanted to sell movies to the South as well as the North and because it was Jim Crow period, they didn't want to have any, any uh, intimation of, of sexual things between uh, black and white and that's really a shame because the movie would be so much better if it had that. It's an interesting film but that limitation really kind of puts a curveball on it and then but then that same year there was one other great after the bomb film and this is I'll show you on the beach and this is the first edition and it was written by Neville Shute who was a mainstream Australian writer and the, and this is a wonderful novel I've I, it's on audio as well I, I it's well worth reading uh, very evocative and the basic notion is there's been an all-out nuclear war and the northern hemisphere is dead and the, then the radiation is coming down to the southern hemisphere and eventually it's going to kill everybody and this takes place in a few months time when an American submarine docks in Australia and its captain who has lost his entire family uh, and his men are there trying to see if there's any hope for a humanity trying to see if there's any way out and it's about a, a, a love affair that starts between him and an Australian woman and it's it's a really good film. It was made into a really good film. The novel's terrific, and it's got this melancholy, and it was directed by Stan... The movie was directed by Stanley Kramer, who would make many great films, including Judgment at Nuremberg, um, Inherit the Wind, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and uh, he was a big A-list a director. He, um, he, he also did it's a, it's a Mad, 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 Mad World, which is a really fun comedy, uh, but he was very... He did serious, socially progressive movies and uh, with, with A-list movie stars, and so this... This stars Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck as the commander of the submarine, and you couldn't have a better lead for that role. He's um, he's wonderful in that role, and he he brings exactly the right mixture of grief and dignity, and uh, he's in he's in denial about his family being dead, and uh, Fred Astaire is in it. Now this is back when when American actors couldn't really do Australian accents. Uh, very well or at all and so it has American actors movie stars in playing Australians so you have Ava Gardner in, the, in as the female lead and she's a very charming actress she had had a terrific career in films big movie star of the time and she's good in this very good and um, but she but if you want to see her in a great role uh, go see Night of the Iguana which was based on the Tennessee Williams um, play it stars Richard Burton it's directed by John Huston who did the, the Maltese Falcon and Treasure of the Sierra Madre. It's a it, it's a great performance and a great film. But 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 on the beach still is a very good movie, very good movie. And it's really about the notion that everyone in the world could die. That every single person watching this movie had that exact same fear because it was very real at the time. I mean, I remember drop d drills when I was a kid, where this teacher all out of the blue would yell drop, and we'd drop under our uh, school desks and and cover our heads because that was um, supposed to protect you from a nuclear bomb. Well, maybe it would have if you were, you know, in New Zealand, but, um, but we were in Los Angeles, and I, we were not going to survive. We would be uh, ground zero. So, um, but, but I still, I grew up under the shadow of, of, of the threat of nuclear war. And uh, so this, this movie has a very real resonance to me. And of course, Rod Serling, by 1959, Rod Serling was writing The Twilight Zone and dealing with... Um, the end of the earth in such in such great episodes as uh, time of time, time enough at last with Burgess Meredith, and um, but the, but but on the beach is a film well worth watching, 
And Fred Astaire, at this point, Fred Astaire was getting older. He had been known as the great dancer, one of the two great dancers in film, uh, the other being Gene Kelly. He was a brilliant choreographer. He was a brilliant dancer. He had been dancing from the early years of the 20th century. He started on stage with his sister Adele and then made a movie career for himself from the 30s on. But by 1959, he was an older man. He was still dancing. But, um, but clearly he was looking to segue into serious acting roles, which he did successfully. And so this, in this he plays a, um, a man who uh, finds, a, he, is, who, who's basically restoring a race car and wants to race it as his sort of his last, um, uh, his great hurrah, his, you know, his, last, his, his uh, swan song. And, and again, although he's not great in an Australian accent, the role, he's very good in the role. So it's, it's a wonderful film, a sad film, but, um, but very, very memorable. So that sort of closes out 1959 and the decade of the 50s. So it's been great to be talking about these wonderful films and these singular films. If you've seen them, I'm sure I've, I've, I've brought a lot of memories back. And if you haven't seen them, go see them because they're um, made with love and made with craft. And, made, and, and many of them, like Forbidden Planet, are at the absolute, they're inventing the technology of, of visual effects in a way that had never been done before. And you know, it's funny because now they look even better than ever because back then, if you were doing a mat, uh, a mat shot, you'd have to, first of all, the previous shot would suddenly get grainy as it transitioned into the, into the effect shot. Bill Warren, my friend who wrote that great book, Keep Watching the Skies, about 1950s films, said that he, he always knew when the, uh, uh, when the effect shot was coming because suddenly the film would get grainy and then it would go into the effect shot because it would be, the effect shot would often be done on what was called an optical printer, so it would be second generation because you were combining first generation film elements into a shot and that's why they would be grainier. And, uh, but, and, and mats would always have a, a mat line around them, like a black line around them, and so it was imperfect. But now, with digital technology, they've cleaned up all those mat lines so the shot looks perfect, and they've brought the colors up and matched the shots where they aren't grainy anymore. And in fact, the films that used to be scratched and you'd see lousy prints or they'd be faded, when you, when you watch a Blu-ray, these are pristine prints and they look gorgeous and they're, they're of a higher quality than you would have seen on television or even in the movies at the time. So. Um, so that we live in a great age to, to, to study these films and enjoy them and uh, be changed by them as, uh, as, as children and adults were changed by them when they first came out. Many of us have careers in, in science fiction because we saw these films and the TV shows we, we would see during that same period because I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. So, and the, so these being movies from the 50s were all, they were what was running on TV and so I saw many of them. But many of them were shown cut down. You couldn't get Blu-rays and DVDs, so I would see them with their beginnings missing or other scenes missing, or I'd catch them on TV a half hour in. So many of these films I never saw in their entirety until I got DVDs and Blu-rays of them. And so we live in a terrific age uh, where we can all share these things and enjoy them. So, so that's it for now. Again, remember to subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi. Hit the button, so the little bell below, so that you'll be notified when a new one of these great videos comes out. Uh, I'm swapping out things in the background so you can see the, the Space Cadet, Tom Corbett Space Cadet, and Space Patrol Watch with uh, Ed Kemmer, Buzz Corey on it, and uh, Supercar. We'll talk about that when we get to the TV shows, and many, many wonderful things. So. Um, so buy Space Command shares, contact me at markzikri at gmail.com or 323-363-1259. Uh, every dollar helps, and as I said earlier, if you do, if you buy 10 shares, I'll fly to your to your town and have a screening of the Space Command pilot just for you and your friends. And so 10 shares, Space Command, that makes it happen. And we'll be filming a lot more in the days to come and posting a lot more. And I just bought some wonderful things from Space Patrol, which we'll be using in Space Command, and uh, much more to come. So that's it for now. The next installment of the History of Science Fiction Film will go into the 60s, which is another great era for science fiction film, and then into the 70s, which, again, it, um, established many of the things that we have seen in, in the days to come. Remember, the 60s has 2001 A Space Odyssey in it, and the 70s has a little film, what was it? I, I don't remember the title, Star? Oh, Star Wars, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so we'll be getting into all of that very, very soon. So until then, have a great time. It's my birthday, so I'm going to go have some cake and blow out some candles and be with friends. And that's about it. Talk soon, guys. Bye.